primary motives were apparently economic. Mahmoud wanted to turn his capital city, Ghazna, into one of the greatest cities of the Islamic world. He tried to attract all the leading poets, literary figures and scholars to his court, but that required more money than the kingdom produced. Mahmoud therefore looked to the temples of neighboring India. Their treasuries were bulging with precious stones. Mahmoud coveted the gold and silver objects, which in his eyes were dedicated to idolatry. This provided an excellent chance to combine sheer greed with religious zeal, and Muslim armies began to enter India on a regular basis. Mahmud of Ghazna was the first in a long line of Muslim conquerors and immigrants who came to India from Central Asia, Iran and Afghanistan. All of these came to make their fortunes in India. Islam became important in India and it influenced Hinduism in two ways. First, Islam's mysticism sometimes blended with Indian mysticism and its monotheism sharpened Hinduism's monotheistic tendencies. Second, most Hindus rejected Islam and through their negative reaction they strengthened their own Hindu religious beliefs. Bhakti movements renewed Hinduism between the 9th and 18th centuries of the common era. Devotees were not interested in the dry philosophical doctrines of the Advaitins who were discussing the ultimate and single reality of being. Bhakti devotees instead concentrated on the ecstatic love of God. They fully embraced the notions of sacrifice, surrender and devotion all of which the word bhakti implies. The bhakti movements were also highly personal. Bhakti devotees worshipped God as a person, not as the featureless absolute being described by the Advaitins. Believers imitated the poet saints who were central to bhakti. Stories from the lives of those ecstatic poets were well known. One of the most highly developed devotional movements was focused on a human known as Krishna. Krishna technically was believed to be an incarnation of Vishnu, but Krishna's followers identified him as being truly God. Vishnu was simply another name for him. Krishna's place in Hinduism was like that of Jesus in Christianity. Each was believed by his respective followers to be God incarnate, that is, God in the flesh. A number of the poet saints were women, and the bhakti movements often gave women a central and honored place. Krishna's consort Radha became the role model both for male and female believers. Radha's selfless devotion to Krishna became the model to follow for all Krishna's devotees. Throughout the 19th century, Hinduism gradually had become aware of itself in a new way. Now Hindus began to define themselves more sharply in contrast to other religions, such as Islam and Christianity. they arrived in India during the early 17th century, British merchants sought trade concessions from the Mughal emperors who were Muslims. After some time, they realized that most people were not Muslims. Only in the early 19th century did the term Hinduism come into wide use, and the Indians then picked up the usage from the British. A very confusing thing is that Hinduism is not an indigenous term at all. Hindus don't refer, didn't refer to themselves as Hindus before British times. Uh, British used the term in part as a way of distinguishing between Hindus and Muslims. It also became a matter of census and voting, which is that if you called yourself a Hindu, then you gave yourself more power, since there was more people who called themselves Hindu, against Muslims. So the term is not indigenous at all. Now, of course, it's taken a life of its own, and it is used by people in India to describe these religions in South Asia. Religions excluding Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, and Jainism are all called Hinduism.
it's an umbrella term. Ram Mohan Roy was one of the major figures involved in the modern development of Hinduism. Roy said the decline in Hindu beliefs and social customs was caused by centuries of Muslim rule. In his mid-twenties, Roy began to acquire land. He moved to Calcutta, the capital of British India. There he began lending money to the young Englishman who worked there for the East India Company. Eventually, Roy received a job in the East India Company's revenue administration, and this gave him even greater access to the British. Ram Mohan Roy celebrated British rule, which brought, in his words, the cheering influence of equitable and indulgent treatment. Roy believed British rule would enable Hindus to return to the pure teachings of the ancient past. Another trend that began in the 19th century was the tie between Hinduism and Indian politics. Bal Gangadhar Tilak was a leader who quickly realized that appeals to religion could mobilize the Indian masses. Tilak was an implacable opponent of British rule. Though trained in the law, he refused to have anything to do with a career in the British-run courts. Instead, he became the editor of a newspaper called Kesari, which was published in the Marathi language of Tilak's home area. Tilak's views led to several arrests for inciting anti-British feeling and communal discord. The British imposed strict censorship on political speech in India. When Tilak died in 1920, he probably was the most popular leader of the Indian National Congress Party. Nevertheless, his anti-British rhetoric had long-lasting consequences. Mohandas K. Gandhi was born in the tiny native state of Porbanda in Gujarat on India's west coast. His father was prime minister to the area's ruler. Gandhi's kin group, the Bedi Banyas, were Hindu merchants. Over the centuries, they had deeply imbibed the ethical principles of Jainism, particularly the teachings of Ahimsa, or complete non-violence. Ahimsa really means uh, total non-violence, that is, non-violence in thought, word, and deed. And um, so this uh, philosophy of Ahimsa is uh, not really attainable by an individual, by any common person. But he perceived this as uh, a student who goes to school and he or she aspires to get an A-plus grade. But not all students who go to school can get an A-plus grade, but every one of them aspires to get it. So in the same sense, we may not totally become nonviolent in our life ever, but we must constantly aspire to reach that uh, level, to whatever stage we can. During World War I, Gandhi worked hard to support the British cause. He expected that cooperation would bring later political concessions from the British Empire. Instead, the British enacted a series of extremely repressive laws that limited the political rights of Indians. Gandhi now became a strong opponent of British rule. Where once he had worn fashionable London-made suits and bowler hats, he began wearing the white loincloth and simple shirt of a wandering holy man. Gandhi began addressing the Indian masses in the language of religion. He described his tactics as Satyagraha, a high-flown Sanskrit term meaning holding to the truth. Truth meant considerably. Uh, it was a, of gr tremendous importance to grandfather. Uh, in all his life. You know, at one stage he used to say, God is truth. And then later in his life he realized that truth is God. And that uh, what we are re really trying to do is to achieve that ultimate truth. And that is realization of God, uh, uh, Godhood. He called his movement uh, Satyagraha, which is a combination of two Sanskrit words.